Well, welcome back, everybody, and thank you for staying with us through the day. Uh, my name is Kevin Barron. I'm executive editor of Defense One. We're the new uh, website, new, a year, a year old almost now, from Atlantic Media. I hope you're all very familiar with us by now. If you're not, please get familiar with us. Uh, our panel is now about preparing the military. We've heard lots of topics on policy and politics and General Dempsey's remarks, and we have three very distinguished guests here. You, you all hopefully know well. First, General Cartwright, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, now at CSIS, among many other hats that he's wearing. He was telling me about, I can't keep up with them all, uh, congressional commissions and boards and lots of these panels. Uh, Rebecca Grant is at uh, IRIS, thank you, IRIS Independent Research. She uh, uh, does research on air power and defense. And finally, Lieutenant General O'Reilly, formerly from Missile Defense Agency, now a fellow here at the Scowcroft Center. Good. So among the things we've heard today, I think um, to go back to the beginning in the morning when General Dempsey described us as a, as a world of dynamic threats to go with the dynamic security theme of the conference, uh, where we have still have the state to state on the top and we've got the you know, terrorism in the middle and Iran and North Korea and all the way down to cyber. And how wide those challenges are means how wide the choices are uh, to deal with them. And since we're talking about technology, we wanted to kick off about those technological choices. Um, as well as hear from your own perspectives, what's on the, the forefront of your mind. So where can we start with? Uh, I'm supposed to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, looking at uh, the challenges that are there, and I think they were laid out reasonably well this, this morning. Um, the, the Nick report is really a foundational document from which to depart. Um, one of the better ones that I've ever seen and, and the fact that it's out there in public and you can get it off websites, et cetera, uh, gives us a reasonable foundation and conversation and dialogue um, on a much broader scale than if it were locked in some vault someplace and only certain people could know what the threat was. Um, so, you know, whether you look at the issue of it being broadly diffused and and proliferating and the rate of change and, and all of the demographics and climate and energy and all of those pieces. Um, I think, quite frankly, the Quadrennial Defense Review and the Secretary's statement about that review um, is probably defines where, where as a nation we are taking the greatest risk. And that is the trade between capability and capacity. And, and the issue of capacity and how do we start to find capacity, the issue of capability in a world where it's not, you know, the 50-year the shipbuilding cycle, it's the 18-month Moore's Law cycle that you're really fighting inside of. And how do you reconcile that industrial challenge, which as much as we want to wish away long timelines to build aircraft carriers and tanks and airplanes, you're not going to do that except on the margin. Um, how do you now start to compete? How do you prepare you know, our, our, our forces and capabilities and array them in such a way that you acknowledge, one, that you're not going to be preeminent for 20 years under patent law. You're going to be maybe a cycle and a half of industrial um, production, and then everybody's going to have that secret, whatever it is, that capability, whether it's your iPad or whether it is you know, the next tank. Uh, quite frankly, they're not going to last that long. So. How do you start to position the, the services, the military, the national security apparatus to live in a world that has to combine the two, find the nexus between the industrial stuff, because we have to have platforms, and the reality of the battlefield, and as Bob Gates would always say in frustration, I want stuff for the war we're in, not the war somebody envisions 20 years from now. I've got to have stuff in the, you know, that, that responds on that timeline. And from my perspective during that conflict, or these conflicts of the last 15, 20 years, on the battlefield, you're really talking about, if you look at the IED fight, the improvised explosive device fight, that's a 30-day fight. You build a fuse, connect it to, to a, an explosive. I go out and try to figure out how to counter the fuse. Um, I figure that out, and now we're back into it, and you're figuring out a new fuse. And that's a 30-day cycle. That's a 30-day cycle on a battlefield. You've got to respond inside of that 30 days. And if you don't, 
its lives, its people that are, you know, that are stepping on these things or walking by these things or they're being blown up as they pass by, whatever it is, that's a 30-day fight. If you look at the cyber fight, it's more like 14 to 20 days. So seven, 15 years, you know, those kinds of, of activities are now telling us, I believe, that platforms as a solution to a problem on the battlefield is not the way of the future. It, it really can't be. You cannot deal in, in 15 and 20 year cycles. You have to deal in months at, at the best. So in a life of an aircraft, as an example, 20 years, you're probably gonna get four major upgrades in that 20 years, you know, if, if you're lucky. Okay, fine, but that's not gonna be relevant to the battlefield that's changing every few days. So how do you start to think about these capabilities and how do you start to think about doing it different? In my sense, you know, to not be completely negative about this thing, um, you know, the work that, for instance, the Navy has done with modularity, the idea of being able to change missions, to be able to adapt, you know, and not take 20 or 30 years to do it. It's still young, it's got its warts right now, but the thought process is probably the right thought process. And if you look on the Air Force side at the Rapid Capabilities Office, the idea of building an airframe in which the mission bays and the mission equipment are published. You know exactly what the volume of that space is, what the air, air conditioning and temperature control, et cetera, is gonna be. You know exactly what the electrical power unit connections are. Now, whatever problem I run into, I can go to the business world and say, what can you do for me, and what can you do for me quick? And they're not starting from zero, and we don't have to build the airframe around it. You know, all I need to do is figure out what, is the, what are the aerodynamic capabilities and characteristics that I need. That defines the platform. Now I go look at what the volumes are available, et cetera, and I start to go to work, and I have a much better chance of doing that. Um, those kinds of thought processes, while they're not completely in, you know, inculcated into the industry or into the, um, the military yet, have demonstrated over the last 10 years that they are on a path to be fundamentally game changers, at least on the acquisition side and the provisioning side. If capacity is the issue, which I believe it is, um, quite frankly, it, it never pure, but, but it is one of the key risks that we're taking. In a downsizing activity, capacity is critical. What have we done in historically to get at the issue of capacity? And if you go back and you take yourself all the way back to the world wars through the inter interim time of, of Vietnam and Korea and, and some of those conflicts to where we are today, one of the things that's clear, if you use the Army as an exemplar, um, you can use almost any service, but in the Army, we fought those world wars as armies. It took armies in order to cover the landscape that we needed to cover, the frontage we needed to cover, be in all the places we needed to be, and to have the effect, the lethality that we needed to have. Come fast forward to Vietnam and Korea, it was divisions. Divisions were the measure of merit, the size of the units. They had the mobility and the frontage and the, and the lethality to operate as armies that had operated in the past. Now we're operating as brigades, mobility, lethality, et cetera. So the path is one that's reasonably set out. We have figured it out. The most recent uh, technological advances that gave us the capability to operate at brigades had to do with survivability and stealth and had to do with the concept of precision. Okay, and people say, okay, precision weapons, that means you hit the target with less bombs, et cetera. That's true, but the real value to the department in precision was the amount of rolling stock people, materials that we have to move to the front in order to prosecute something at a high rate. That was drastically reduced, drastically reduced. Okay, well over 60% was moved out. That kind of thought process is how you start to think about what do we do about capacity. Now the question is, what do we do today about capacity? How do we start to think about that issue in a way that makes sense? My sense, and I, again, a, a couple of exemplars out of the services, but for instance, the Navy will start to uh, play around with, experiment with, however you want to look at it, directed energy in, in the upcoming year, okay? Why is that interesting? Well, 
it maybe will address 5 10% of the targets that they could, thin-skinned, soft-skinned, relatively stable targets. Okay, great. That's because of the energy management. That's all got upside potential over time. That will only get better. What's really interesting when you look at it is if let's just take two Aegis class ships and we put them out there in some scenario and we say, okay, you're out there and a bunch of targets are running around out there. Some of them are expensive and highly protected and some of them are thin skinned, et cetera. Well, at a million dollars a pop, we're gonna throw SM6 or cruise missiles at it. And, and they will only last as long as the magazine on that ship has, has weapons, which is finite, very finite. And then the ship has to leave. And the only way you get scale in that construct is build more ships. So give me 20 years and I'll get you some more ships out there. Not, not feasible. Look at the directed energy side of the equation and what the Navy's saying, and I, you know, I won't believe the numbers um, because they'll, they'll change with time, but they're advertising right now 87 cents a shot. Okay, unlimited magazine, a fundamental game changer. Even if it is five or ten percent of the of the of the target set, not expending cruise missiles and SM6 on thin-skinned ships or boats is a huge game changer out there. It changes how we start to think about the, the fight. Um, directed energies in that class, the rail guns in that class, offensive cybers in that class, all things that are fundamental game changers for capacity. Okay, for persistence, for the ability to stay, for enlarging the magazine of finite industrial built vessels, platforms. Okay? So when you start to look at that, you start to say, okay, this is, this is something I should be thinking about and investing in and working towards, which the services are doing. To me, that's a big one. Another one that's out there that I think is probably going to start to change the game because it has moved in other areas and one that I'm a, a, a strong proponent of is uh, it's being called cognitive mobility. But it is the idea that I can take intellectual capital, put it in a place here in the United States, university, you know, uh, a combatant commander's headquarters, you pick it. And when, it, when I employ it, I can employ it any place in the world. So think medicine, think, you know, instead of field hospitals and all of the things that we had prior to these last two conflicts, I now just reach out, I give, you know, a, a device, an iPad, something like that, to a corpsman. He shows the doctor, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. The doctor says, you know, stitch that up, tourniquet that, plug that, get him out of there, okay? That's a fundamental game changer. Okay, that's what we did basically in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Triage was the capacity that we had before that. The best triage ever did, best absolute best, was if you had some sort of a mortal life-threatening injury, you could get about a 60 to 65% chance of survivability. That's the best we ever did. The military invented the concept of triage in the Civil War, and that's what we've been using up until now. Now you have a fundamental shift shift in EMS, in, you know, in commercial medicine, et cetera, because of this concept of cognitive mobility. When I walk into the office, I can take my cognitive capability and put it any place on the face of the earth. It can go anywhere. And what can I do with that? How can I start to think about that? That really is the underpinning of a lot of the value of so-called drones, remotely piloted. Pilot walks into the, into the Ready room, walks into the cockpit, doesn't care what country he's in, really doesn't care what mission, sits down, flies, and then goes back home. I get a full day out of him, et cetera. What's the difference? Right now, you take a ship, you take an airplane, you take a tank, you've got to have a driver at the point of transaction deployed any place where that vehicle is going to go. That vehicle is limited by that individual. It has to have it. And you start to say, okay, why am I doing it that way? When the alternative is I can have one pilot and through automation or machine learning, six airplanes at any given time, any place in the world. I can fly those missions. The airframe is basically designed for whatever the threat environment's gonna be, whether it goes high, whether it goes low, whether it goes fast, whether it goes slow, high dynamics. 
today, uh, I'll, I haven't beat up on the Navy enough yet. So the Navy, you know, the F-18, um, we built that. I was one of the engineers in the design phase of that aircraft. Okay. Now we've built the F-35. The F-35 doesn't go any further, doesn't go any faster, carries less weapons, okay. has great avionics okay, inside the cockpit. It takes a major with a master's degree in aerodynamic engineering and also a master's in information technology who was saturated when the, when the aircraft didn't have all that stuff and now is even more saturated. Okay, does that make sense? But, we, but the good news is it costs about three times as much. <laughs> um, you know, so we're at diminishing returns. We're at diminishing returns because of where we put the cognitive power and how we move it around. And the last one, you know, that's along the similar lines. In, in this case, you took cognitive power, digitized it, moved it around the world, okay? Think about additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing, sometimes called 3D printing. The construct is, I now have digitized what that entity is that I want to, to, to produce. I can send it any place in the world. I don't have to worry about you know, um, obsolescence. I can prototype at a rate that's fundamentally different, but I can take those digits and turn them into real material, whether it be food, whether it be materials, spare parts, new parts, new functionality, integrate that into a fleet that's widely dispersed without having to bring it back at a rate that is far faster than anything I could do today. Those kinds of concepts are where the leverage is likely to be. Whether every one of those or parts of those get realized, you know, will, will be proven over time. But we have to, you know, we have to function, focus on those areas that will be counter to the capacity issues that we're dealing with. Because at the end of the day, you can demand that the Congress give you more money, you can demand that the American people, but at the end of the day, we're only gonna get enough resource, the amount of resource that the American people are willing to give us, okay? And the mission is always gonna grow, uncle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's fascinating to hear you speak of this. These are the choices facing the Pentagon today. It's far more complicated than do we keep the A-10 or not, yeah. right? Or do, you know, how quickly do we move past the LCS or not? So I wanna ask Rebecca, you, you wanna take a turn at Initial thoughts before we get into, <laughs> I have a lot of questions off of what General Before we dive right into the A-10 and the merits of the, <laughs> yeah, right. of the Hornet, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, on which I know you're a very objective observer. Uh, when, when I look at this, to me, I, I'd say there are five things that, that concern me most. Uh, really, there could be more than that, but I'd like to talk about five things and start with ships, then aircraft, uh, information, after that, doctrine, and its potential for disruption and disruptive behavior. And finally, emerging technologies. So let's talk a minute about ships. When we set out to discuss how to prepare the military or prepare our force structure for what comes next, I think we all understand that, uh, that quite a bit of what we're going to have in that next time frame is what's already out there and, of course, what's already being planned. And probably nowhere is that more uh, carefully locked in than in the 30-year shipbuilding plan. Um, so that's the first area of concern for me because, as all of you who follow it know, we've had a lot of proposals about what to do with this 30-year shipbuilding plan. One thing that's driving that is the Congressional Budget Office, for example, tells us that right now we spend on average somewhere between 12 to $14 billion a year on ship modernization. In order to afford the plan uh, about 10 years from now, that average will have to bump up to about 18 billion a year or even higher. You know, so simply put, we're looking to buy quite a bit in that plan. We are looking to buy uh, an Ohio-class replacement of ballistic missile submarine. We're looking to buy fleet oilers. We're looking at more aircraft carriers, some number of LCS, some frigate-like uh, configuration that's a new proposal coming out. Uh, and then, of course, a successive flights of DDGs, uh, the very ships that we find that are the ones getting harassed out in the Black Sea by the Russians, and we find them, if there's a hot spot, guarantee there is a destroyer probably somewhere in very close proximity to that. So they're quite a useful platform. 
Um, what concerns me there is that we have bounced from budget number to budget number so often that, in my view at least, we in Washington have not had that deep strategic conversation about what we want the Navy to look like. In the 1990s and 2000s, we moved to this modularity path. We understand the requirements for presence, but also for warfighting. Warfighting is back in a big way in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, and the threats are there. I know that we'll be hearing more about um, the tremendous progress that we've made with sea-based missile defense in the last 10 years. Uh, but my first concern would be with that shipbuilding plan. It, it is absolutely time to look hard at that plan in my opinion, this is no time to be talking about retiring aircraft carriers. We probably need more than we have at this point. So where are we with that? That is a, that is a real level of investment, real requirements, and something that is not easy to move quickly. So that ships. Uh, on aircraft, um, after the 1991 Gulf War, which was now a pretty long time ago, there was a move throughout DOD to go to more stealth and precision. And I think in a word we can say now this plan just didn't work in the way that we intended it to. Now, unfortunately, from the perspective of perhaps five years ago, that might not have seemed to be such a serious thing. We had truncated F-22 uh, delays in the tri-service and allied F-35 program. Where we sit now, though, we see that we are back to looking at um, one, some increasing threats to our military aircraft, obviously the surface-to-air missiles that we talk about all the time. China has a growing Air Force that is growing in its activity, and given its geostrategic position is something that we absolutely cannot discount. We also want to use air power, whether that's uh, in reconnaissance and surveillance, uh, in establishing no-fly zones, or in shaping our major theater operations. So we count on air to literally set the context for what we do as a military. Question then, do we have the right plan going forward? We look fairly strong in reconnaissance, uh, but perhaps not as strong in reconnaissance against more heavily defended airspace. Uh, our fighter program is, is in a bit of disarray. Uh, my opinion, absolutely right to proceed with F-35. That will be the right aircraft, the difficulty, buying them at the rate that we need to and retiring the older airframes that we need to retire. So that's why we see the constant turmoil in choices, whether that's uh, from the A-10 and the, and the KC-10s to the Global Hawk and the U-2. It astonishes me in a way that we're thinking of retiring reconnaissance platforms when our, our global requirements are simply growing. Um, and a big need, of course, for long-range strike and specifically a new stealth bomber. We task our current fleet of B-2s for crisis response and roles in war plans to a level that I think well exceeds what 20 aircraft can do for us. So we need something more there. So I'm concerned about how we will make our choices in the aircraft program. Third area is information. Obviously, in a way, this boils down to cyberspace and how we exploit and use it. The good news is, I think we now largely accept that cyberspace is a domain and is a warfighting domain. What I think concerns me most is how well do we understand how much importance and how much risk we have taken in so closely incorporating cyber and information into all of our warfighting systems and the things that support them. Are we really able to understand the level of risk that we have year by year, month by month incorporated. Um, I'm not saying that's not a risk that we don't want to take. I think we do want to take that and proceed there and look for uh, maintaining dominance in that domain just as we do in others. Um, General Dempsey has talked very eloquently about the role of cross-domain dominance, but the thing that I would single out in information is for us to better understand uh, where the levels of risk lie. Do they lie in that last connection to the tactical platform? Do they lie within the logistics system? Does that risk reside within our assessment of reconnaissance and surveillance information? Where does it sit? We must better understand that. Uh, fourth, doctrine. So before everyone goes to sleep or decides they have to go out and get a brownie and a cup of coffee, let me just say that as we talk about preparing the military, for the most part, the big shocks that we've received historically have not come so much from any particular weapon, be that the exquisite Japanese long-range torpedoes encountered around the Solomon Islands in 1942, or be that the ME-262, any of those things. 
It's been more the ideas for employment of forces. Let's name some of the big ones. Blitzkrieg comes to mind. Um, the use of the Essex-class carrier in World War II was more about how that was combined into the fast carrier task forces. I cite these examples simply to say that it's about when does that moment occur when a potential adversary gets their act together, looks at their geopolitical interests, looks at their force structure, and comes up with a brilliant insight about how to use what they have. So let's be on guard for doctrinal disruption. Finally, and I think perhaps one of the trickiest areas, how do we get the most from emerging technologies? How can this be a concern? We are Americans. We have done a terrific job in dominating technology. We have the smartest people on the planet working some of the toughest problems out there. The danger I see today is that in many areas, we are moving beyond what we might have expected from the past. It's no longer, for example, <coughs> simply about higher, better, faster, and some of the things that General Cartwright brought up. And yet, because of our broad strategic outlook, our inevitable focus over the last three years on the sequester doom budget cycle, I think we've had very little opportunity to try to connect some of the terrific work going on out there in industry, labs, and universities with the next set of military requirements. This is the kind of thing that really has to go on on a continuous basis so that the, the bright engineer out there knows what she needs to propose to the military customer to work that problem. That dialogue is something that's got to be maintained. We're very fortunate to have uh, outfits like DARPA who help to make those connections. But the key then is how does that really transition into the larger military planning cycle? We certainly have some problems that we need to solve. We have a lot of areas where we need to keep an edge. We always have trouble with, I don't know, air-to-air -air missiles and various things that are always tough to do. And we want to look for that next generation of technologies. Um, it's going to really require concerted effort for us to pay attention to some of those and to see how they fit into our requirements. So that's my five areas of concern for now. That's good. I'm, I've got questions for you as well to come up on it. But first, we'll, we'll let Lieutenant General Riley speak. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You had asked uh, originally about uh, matching technologies to threats. Uh, the discussions and the presentations we've had this morning really, I believe, clearly show that that is becoming a daunting, a extremely difficult uh, proposal. Uh, as Mr. Naim said earlier today, uh, I, I think it was very insightful where he pointed out that the most disruptive military technologies <laughs> in the 21st century have been cyber, uh, drones and IEDs, all of those are accessible to non-state actors, which as General Dempsey had laid out, heavyweights, middleweights, networks, and uh, cyber as a paradigm of looking at classes of, of uh, adversaries. Well, this is a case where these technologies, and I believe it's a growing trend, uh, are with the individual being more empowered, they're accessible to uh, even the uh, most loosely disorganized or organized uh, non-state actors. So uh, it is very difficult to uh, bend. Uh, this is the type of technology we need for a near peer competitor. And this is the, you, you really need to be on the forefront of, of technology uh, across the board. And, and uh, if you're vulnerable, if you don't think in terms of worst case applications and the savviest, smartest applications against you. Now, moving to the other uh, uh, point I'd like to make is uh, I'd like to uh, dovetail on uh, General Cartwright's comment about capacity. Uh, there are th steps we can take to enhance our capacity. Uh, and the first of all is, uh, I think, looking at the way, from an acquisition point of view, we focus a lot on the government side of the acquisition process. But the heavy lifting is done by the industrial side. Uh, one uh, policy, one practice that uh, often occurs when you're in fiscally constrained environments, which is what we've been in for a long time, and, and this goes back to the, to the 90s even, is uh, the, the stopping. Uh, it used to be at a point in time where we would have fly-offs as a term. You, you develop prototypes. You, have, you put a, a need out there. You let industry bring to you uh, their best concepts actually manufactured in a way that uh, you can 
competitively compare them. Uh, it, and uh, as a part of uh, cost reduction and uh, the emergence of uh, CAD CAM systems and so forth, uh, models and simulations, we've tried to substitute that with a quicker, supposedly, a decision process. But if you look at how long it takes to make an acquisition decision, in my career, I haven't seen that be reduced. But on the other hand, what it does to the industrial complex is uh, it no longer funds the uh, type of investment or application of the newest ideas that are coming off the factory floors that uh, present themselves when you're actually looking at prototypes and the government's surprised at the, at the response. And uh, we were surprised many times in the quote old days when we would, companies would bring prototypes. So I'm not sure of the cost savings of, uh, of going to decisions at the end of a design and using models and sims, but I'm definitely convinced that we weaken our industrial complex by preventing the, the uh, funding of those type of activities. Craftsmanship is, is key to building high-tech capability. And you're not going to sustain and improve craftsmanship in the supplier base and the, and the uh, integration labs and uh, the factory floors by using models and sims. But once you've decided this is the best design, Going out and getting it, we have found, uh, leads to a lot of problems. Again, delays. Uh, talking in terms of pace of technology change, uh, take an approach where we're actually building different capabilities and testing them in a limited number uh, could speed you up, especially if you take a modular approach, as General Cartwright was referring to. Uh, so that's the other aspect of uh, capacity. And finally, uh, we have a, a growing problem, if it's not that evident, of uh, our education system uh, right now. With in, uh, if you look at participation in science, technology, engineering, and math, which is fundamental to the military, both civilian and the uniform military, having the capacity to understand uh, what they need and how to apply <coughs> technologies. Uh, in between now and 2018, and we have 11.3 million high school graduates in the United States. Uh, the estimates from multiple sources are uh, 820,000 of those 11.3 million will end up with a, a degree, uh, undergraduate degree, in, in STEM subjects. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics predicts the need new jobs between now and 2018 is 7.8 million in the STEM subject areas. So we have a dramatic need for uh, greater uh, capacity in the areas of science and math and technology and engineering. Now, one help in that area was proposed several times this morning in regards of partnerships, international partnerships. And it was frustrating for me inside the government and it's probably more frustrating for me now that I'm, I'm outside the government is looking at and dealing with willing partners uh, who have made technological advances, and we do need these technical partnerships, but our export control process uh, came out of the Cold War. Uh, the latest uh, revisions of it still do not serve the needs of with trusted partners trying to exchange technologies and trying to move forward with uh, our, our uh, our knowledge base, and uh, that's another aspect of capacity. So, uh, you know, just the concrete uh, pr proposals, I would say more fly-offs, take products till you actually build them, and second is a dramatic uh, uh, review and r realistic real-world changes to our export control. When we give a license, when we allow industry to interact, and I have seen industry-to-industry -industry interaction before where it had to occur through diplomatic pouches between two embassies because of the uh, policies uh, which what we have and what other governments have. Thank you. That's an interesting closing remark. I, I've you know, spoken to the British and the, the, the defense minister and lower level ministers who have come to talk about their version of QDR and us and that's the common frame, refrain from them is to be included earlier on pending on decision making about when and how to use partners both in 
whatever the next contingency operation is, or in formulating the strategy at the QDR right. level as well. It's an external frustration to want to get in on American thinking. We went through a lot of topics uh, <laughs> in the introduction period that we had. Um, I'd like to, you know, thinking again about the, the, the threat levels, the high, high to load or, or state to cyber, um, maybe touch on a couple examples of, of the technological challenges facing them. So and I'm thinking of China, I'm thinking of Syria, and, and maybe slash Ukraine, Russia, and cyber after that. And we were speaking earlier, you know, how the, the pivot is often uh, portrayed as it's not about China, but we know it is about China, but it's also about the South China Sea. And it's been in my head of where if the, if the purpose or the, or the concern of the South China Sea is access, is it really about access for, for fighting, for protecting allies like Japan or Taiwan, or is it really about keeping the sea lanes open for economic interests? And if it's really about economic interests, how far is the U.S. willing to go to fire a shot? How much are we willing to spend? What kind of weapons and technologies do we need to, for that protection? And, and is, is, is Congress and the American people willing to, to stand up for that or to go for that or to allow that to occur? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think let's start with Rebecca. You, you're, this is your kind of realm here. Exactly. <laughs> uh, when we talked earlier, we talked a little bit about whether you would really go to war over maritime incidents and trade routes. And although it's a little before your time and even before ours, uh, World War I, of course, the sinking of the Lusitania was a huge thing. It's not like we've never gone to war for trade reasons and partnerships. So. Some, of, some of this is a drinking game, because yeah. you said Lusitania. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hashtag that. Okay. Here we go. OK. <laughs> no, but, there, but there's a very serious point here. And um, you know, in my personal opinion, we're not out to try to fight China. But we need to be able to balance and deter in that theater as we do in others. So what are some of the things that are going on there? You do have, of course, a great deal of the traffic uh, uh, through there, the various straits that are of great importance. But let's think back for a minute to the incident that occurred in uh, December of this year with one of our uh, guided missile cruisers, the USS Kalpins. That was a Revolutionary War battle, wasn't it? They always, it's always Ticonderoga and this and that. Okay. Civil. Oh, it was Civil War. Anyway, the USS Kalpins <laughs> encountered in, I believe, the East China Sea, uh, the uh, Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning, which at one point the Office of Naval Intelligence said was never going to happen. Okay, and, you know, they, they said, well, we're buying it as a casino. We're going to tow it through the Bosphorus. The Turks said, all right, it's a casino. Fine, go ahead. What do you mean it's not a casino anyway? Now it's got a good <laughs> anise kid coding in it. It's a no-kidding aircraft carrier. Uh, it was out with its English-speaking captain who spent two years at the United Services College in Britain, as did 98% of that ship's officer crew, so English speakers, and its escort vessels. They came within 46 yards of the Calpins. Now, there's been recently a treaty on the something about protection of unusual agreements. It's his nickname is Q's, um, to try to manage all this. But again, this is just an example of the kind of things that we can see happening that could lead to inadvertent issues. The bottom line is there is a great deal more activity. Uh, let's look uh, again, East China Sea, China and Japan. According to the Japan uh, Ministry of Defense, the JASDAF, the Japan Air Self-Defense Force, uh, scrambled against Chinese aircraft 415 times in 2013. In the year 2009, they scrambled against Chinese aircraft 36 times, and about 90 in 2010. So you're looking at a 400% increase in activity. What's causing that? Uh, are the Japanese reacting more? Yes, they are. But simple fact, the Chinese are flying more as well. So we have in that theater uh, a heavyweight a uh, potential heavyweight with great advantages in terms of their uh, geography uh, and a clear yen to develop the technologies that, um, that enable them to counter the raids that they think we may be able to do. So this is a game of balance. It's not something we as a nation have faced in the past in the same way. We're looking at a very long-term need to balance in which technology is absolutely crucial. And here, as I talked about ships, aircraft information, we want to be sure we have the mix right going forward to balance this, because there are real threats and real situations. Um, and we want to make sure that things that we keep a lid on this, and we do that <coughs> with the right force structure to do it. But you're, you're still, but that's, those examples are still <laughs> power to power, f posturing over islands versus you know, shipping from, for Walmart and for Amazon to get goods to Americans. And, you know, General Carroy was, we were saying backstage about, about that, that idea of 
would, would the U.S. go to war for that? Would the U.S. fire a shot with, with all these wonderful new pieces of hardware that we're, we're thinking of? Forget the LCS. We need something bigger. We need the frigate. The, we need new any ship missiles. We need to be farther ashore from what China is doing. Is that is that a is that a viable concept <laughs> that, that we're gonna we're gonna stick up for that? Well, you know, most of what I've seen in, in particularly the the Nick report, you know, things like water, energy, commodities, commerce. I mean, all of these issues are going to be. Are, are part and parcel to why we want to be a global nation. And so when that's threatened, you know, that becomes the basis on which we enter into various capabilities and dialogues and, and whatnot that go all the way from influence to destruction. And so, yes, those are things that we historically have fought over. Um, you know, that's not an unreasonable leap. The question for us is, you know, um, people often talk about balance, which is important, but I think what, what General Dempsey, as an example this morning, was talking about is you can't leave anything in the range of military operations empty because you, do, you will not predict the next fight. You will have to adapt to it and be ready for it and be able to do something about it. And so the question here is, one, can you better populate that range of military operations that are envisioned? from influence to destruction? Can you do it across multiple domains at a scale that is appropriate and consequential? Um, it's one thing to say you're going to pivot. It's another thing to put four LCS in the Pacific. I'm at interesting, significant, questionable. But is that the right met metric even, to no. count hardware, to count ships? Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the issue here is, are we using the right metrics to think about our, our capacity for power and influence? And, and, and have we got enough tools in that toolbox? Some of the allure of um, non-kinetic weapons, quite frankly, whether they be cyber or directed energy and whatnot, is that you have a set of graduated effects you know, it's, it's the old uh, Spock and, and, you know, Kirk on the bridge going, okay, let's set, it to, let's set it to stun for this one, okay? I mean, you have that capacity now in, in a way that we never had before. I think uh, uh, Steve Hadley has, has been quoted many times as saying that many of the conflicts we've gotten into are the result of running out of effective measures that take us from influence into the, into the uh, um, conflict and the ability to manage escalation and the ability to deter at a lower level than we currently do. And so the question is, do, do the capabilities that we envision for the future and the capacities address a reasonable continuum across multiple domains such that the likelihood of entering into this can tolerate the Japanese having an aircraft carrier or or some guy in a cave with a laptop attacking the towers. I mean, is, do we have a broad enough set of range? Can we cover that? And do we have the capacity to be at the right place at the right time with an effective deterrent or capability? That, that's the challenge here. Well, it, this leads me in my head to, to the Syria problem and how I, I had said to them, uh, I, was, I was traveling uh, with the press corps with Secretary Hagel right before the decision was being made, do we go to war with Syria or not? Back in August, we were in Southeast Asia. And at the time, we all thought, gee, we thought after counterinsurgency years that our, our, next, our next conflict was supposed to be counterterrorism. And yet here we were, we were, here we were with <clears throat> submarines in the Mediterranean with cruise missiles ready to go, air flies, no-fly zones being considered with good old-fashioned fighters, good old-fashioned, uh, you know, the big traditional war fighting hardware, not all the special ops you know, hardware, not all the, not the, the cyber you know, pow, pow, not all the new gadgets we were talking about. It was old-fashioned power projection and whether or not it would be used or not. Is that, is that um, I guess, middle level, but somewhere between special ops night vision and nuclear weapons comes that kind of big realm of weaponry, of, of technological capabilities. Is that still being focused on enough as we look towards building this enormous spectrum of being able to do everything at, at a moment's notice, like you said, uh, today with, with what we're facing. And how, is, how hard is that when you've all been in the Pentagon? How hard is it in the Pentagon to 
keep that spectrum going? Uh, it's extremely hard <laughs> because uh, each of those systems you were referring to, uh, our existing systems have an infrastructure. And if you don't support that infrastructure and maintain it, uh, I think General Dempsey brought up a, a good point today about shedding old weapons and the difficulties we have with that. Part of this equation of this de the, these uh, deliberations involve um, stakeholders and constituencies that uh, are tied to existing infrastructure that have to be dealt with in order for us to get the investments to have the full spectrum of capability that you're referring to. You can't predict. I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me that we were dealing with Syria. Uh, it, doesn't it wouldn't have surprised me if the you know, next day we're dealing with a major piracy issue. It is all over the, the uh, spectrum. And we Nigerian cannot, school girls. It, I was thinking of that earlier. And, <laughs> and so look at the capability we have sent over there as we speak. So uh, you cannot predict uh, the technology you're going to need for specific applications. You can see a historical trend that, one, you need to keep up with the pace of technology, or you put yourself at a great disadvantage. And two, you must have the capacity to uh, acquire that, uh, to obtain it one way or the other as quickly as possible. Well, I'll, I'll but, go ahead. And having said that, there are some things that we use over and over again that, that go to things that we don't want to give up. And as hard as it is to retire, let's look at what we did just in the last few months. Okay, Baltic air policing. I wrote an op-ed on that in 2012. I'm sure it's the only person who ever written about, you know, F-16s up in the, in the Baltic republics. But it's, it became part of an option for General Breedlove as SACUR to beef up Baltic air policing. Um, and so that's step one. What are the, the next branches and sequels that go with that? That is you know, good old F-16s and other NATO aircraft. And again, this is from a base that we've taken down very, very small. We have very little of our air presence left in, in NATO. What about the Black Sea? So the destroyer, the Don Buscook that was harassed in the Black Sea, it's a destroyer, all right? This is exactly what you send in. The Russians claim they didn't get their notice and this and that, and, and it was the old Cold War days of Paris 24s trying to drive this ship crazy. You know, go ahead, shoot at me, shoot at me, shoot at me. They're perfectly capable of defending themselves, and they certainly know how to handle that type of harassment. It was very common back in the old Cold War days. However, that's the type of forces that you put out there. So. You know, almost no matter where the situation occurs, there are certain forces that are very, very useful. So it's, if it's F-16s in Baltic air policing and the successor F-35s for NATO partners and for ourselves, these are the kind of things that we have to be sure that we have because evidently, or it's, it's the, the tomahawks from uh, submarines or from surface uh, Navy ships, evidently that's what we need right now when we least expect it for the wars that we're in, as your former boss said. Well, you know, if, if, the, if, if you can have lots of technological solutions, though, for across the spectrum, uh, you know, you said earlier there's, there's, a, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a disconnect with industry and DOD right now. Industry's got lots of ideas, lots of great technologies coming out sparked by the last decade of spending on, obviously, and, and, and need. Now trying to shoehorn that into a much narrower budget and much more confusing or undecided, perhaps a better word, um, Threat, threat matrix, risk. Uh, I don't, my first thought was, well, wh whose fault is that? Is that, is that you know, good, good on industry for having, those, just for having all these wonderful solutions for a military that may not need all those solutions right now versus a military that just can't figure out what they want to do yet or the Congress that supports them? Well, I like the general's point about uh, fly-offs. And maybe we can talk about that for a minute and a little bit about how we handle emerging technology. Certainly, if you look at the number of uh, fixed-wing military aircraft developed by the Air Force and the Navy. So in the 40s, it's a huge number. In the 50s, it's a big number like this, even in the 60s. It comes down to really just a few systems, even if we include things like uh, the P-8, which is uh, certainly a new aircraft, but sort of a modification of a, a commercial a 737 airframe. You know, what is the role of fly-offs? One thing that we hear suggested a lot is to increase our work with X-planes, that are experimental that will do just what you said of bring that prototype in and let us see how it works. And it, it allows you to have, um, you know, it's not just aircraft design, but it's there are specialists who do things like 
cockpit pyrotechnics, which is how you fit the ejection seat or the escape rods. You know all about that kind of stuff, right? Well, not from personal experience, but <laughs> from briefings, right? How do you work that into the cockpit? How do you have the people who do the range safety? There may be only a few of these people at a Skunk Works uh, with Lockheed Martin or a Phantom Works with Boeing. How do you keep those skills fresh going forward? Some of our best aircraft were bought without fly-offs, like the F-15. Bought off a of paper design, great success. In other cases, we've seen much better use. So, you know, there's, there's some ability there for the, the buyer to decide how they want to make that decision. Will we have a fly-off for the next stealth bomber? I don't know. It's a black program. We don't know. So no one's going to tell us how that's going to go. But the question of how we incorporate it is one that I think doesn't get nearly enough attention. You're so right to raise it. Um, I, I don't disagree on how you go at the truck, okay? But the truck will not solve the problem. It will not keep pace with the threat. That's, that's our basic challenge here. You have to have them, but it's that mission equipment. I mean, it's, it, that's, that's where you get your so-called agility, the ability to realize that you will not guess right on what the next conflict's going to be, number one. Number two, when you actually find yourself in it, the threat that you find yourself is going to morph quickly and continue to morph all the way through that fight. And you're going to have to stay with it or ahead of it, ideally. And the platform will not do that for you. The platform will give you a venue, survivable, jumps higher, runs faster, whatever. Um, but you will be stuck with the platforms you have. That, that's not going to change. And so the question becomes, how do you take these two, separate them, but keep them integrated? Um, some of what I've seen, particularly with the Navy in recent acquisitions, certainly some with the Air Force, is separating mission equipment from the platform and making the mission equipment program manager the lead, not the platform. Okay. That, that's not the way the F-35 was built. That's not the way the F-15, F-18, et cetera, were built. Um, you know, and so the, the question here becomes, what could materially make a big difference? I can do fly-offs, and I, I tend to agree on, particularly from the standpoint on fly-offs, of understanding manufacturability. But those timelines should be associated with the truck. The, the mission equipment has to be basically done. It can be competed, it can be prototyped, it can be fly before you buy, but you're looking for what's going to solve the problem. And quite frankly, from my experience, saying to someone in the field, ah, you need to wait another six months before a fly off, I'll take a 10% solution if it'll save two or three people, okay? And then we'll improve on it. But I've gotta be able to do that at the pace of the fight. Talking months, days, weeks. Okay, Any, there's no tolerance for anything else. Anytime you have to build a platform to solve a problem, it will be a cost-imposing strategy on you. MRAP was a cost-imposing strategy on us at the end of the day. I mean, that was designed to be, and it was very effective at that. And even after we built them, you know, one pound of explosive meant 2,000 more pounds of armor. So I mean, there was no winning that. We had to do it. We didn't have a better answer doesn't mean that it was the right way to go at the problem. And so, again, my sense here is, you know, you've got to have the adaptability to realize you're not going to guess right, you don't know what you're going to end up in as a fight tomorrow, and that when you're in that fight, it's going to morph in weeks and months, not in years. And it's going to do it quickly, and you've got to be able to, to answer that. And taking and shaving off um, the idea of fly-offs in order to say, I got it out faster, is, tech, is statistically insignificant in the fight. It just doesn't make any difference, the difference in time. You've got to be able to fundamentally change the game. If you look at the signals game in Afghanistan and Iraq, that turned on about a 40-day cycle. You had to change basic sensors every 40 days to keep up with them. This week I'm on press to talk, next week I'm on a different frequency, whatever it is. You've got to be inside of that, and, and we can't do that with platforms. So that's, that's kind of one push there. I really agree that the next big trends in the fight are not about these technologies. They will enable it. But whether it's 
you know, the, you know, the idea of Blitzkrieg or the idea of whatever kind of fighting is, is you find yourself in, those challenges you know, are going to be perceived by us as unfair. Okay, that's the way they've always been perceived. So if we're attacked by a guy in a cave with a laptop, we're gonna say that's unfair. Regional conflicts are going to be exposed to global knowledge and global proliferation in the environment we're living in now. There is no such thing anymore as a single country or regional issue. They're gonna spill over into cyberspace and space. You know, they're going to have global impacts, whether it's on an energy channel passing through the strait or whether it is on you know, the passing of comms, it's gonna have a, a, a major impact. So we have to get inside these decision cycles with things that are relevant to those fights. And we find both policy, law, and doctrine don't necessarily keep up with the opportunities that technology presents itself. So I want the audience to get ready for questions for us, please. The last thing to say, is this, is this what happened to the LCS? That uh, the, the, the platform was, I guess, overtaken by by threats, by a new, a new need? What, what well, my sense is LCS was our first surface combatant foray into modular activity. They already had separated mission equipment from platform. Mm -hmm. That was good, so you had modulars that could ideally be replaced. So if you found yourself needing something more of, you could, you could take the same hull and do it. It would cut some time off, but, you know, you know but, the lessons learned in it, you know, just like we do with every other platform, F-15, and, and what we went through with tails and wings and stress and everything else, we learn over time. And that's why you're gonna have to have big mod programs. But it's not that we're getting rid of the platform. The question is, can the platform remain relevant once it gets into a conflict that it didn't anticipate? And that, that, that's the big challenge. Well, that's what I mean, is that, that LCS is now into a situation that didn't exist when it was first designed to be there. And the question now in. is in the modular side of the equation, can you put on that, whether it be armament, sensors, or whatever it is, can you put that there? Remember, I don't remember, one of the key reasons that we stayed with LCS and with Aegis um, platforms was the size of the hull and the affordability of that size ship versus something much larger and having enough scale to have these be out and about in the places we were gonna need them. Um, if we now decide that we have to go to a bigger hull form, mm -hmm. we're not gonna have as many of them. I mean, that, there are limited dollars and cents here. So the question becomes, can I get my lethality, can I get my range of effect in a smaller hull form with modularity? That's not proven yet one way or the other. If I could, I would like to clarify. When I said fly <laughs> off, I know we all went to platform and it was my choice of words. Uh, I do meet, uh, I think there is a, a, a real need and you can meet the rapid pace of introducing capability out there uh, by mission packages may have been a better word, uh, competing prototype mission packages. But the point is to actually build them. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take long. Uh, and I had a recent conversation uh, in the wireless industry. I was meeting with some uh, young engineers, and they started to talk to me about the implications of 3D printing and being able to create waveforms that weren't achievable before just because you can make shapes in conducting materials that you couldn't do before. But I was sitting there, and it was like one of the most advanced electronic warfare discussions I'd ever had, and these were recent college graduates. They were all double E's, brilliant people, but, and they had a background in the wireless industry. So they could put together in that room three or four different mission packages. The point is, is to, is to sustain that capacity, is to allow them to do that. And uh, maybe less analysis up front, since we've talked about the unpredictability, but more of the actual building of these capabilities. And, and again, I, I fly off as associated usually with platforms, but I, I'm talking mission packages that could go on UAVs or, or anything, uh, trucks, submarines, so forth. Start here in the front row. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Randall Fort with Raytheon. Um, one of the sort of legacy core mission areas um, that the U.S. military still maintains is our nuclear deterrence. And over the last year or so, there have been a number of, shall we say, incidents and episodes, particularly with the Air Force. Um, uh, uh, General Cartwright, given your previous responsibility as, as the head of strategic command, just wonder, do you see these new technologies as in sort of in the medium term at least or longer, actually replacing our legacy nuclear forces, directed energy, cyber, conventional prompt global strike, um, or is it possible these new technologies will be able to enhance um, our legacy nuclear forces and make them uh, more effective, safer, um, uh, and uh, more reliable as a, uh, as a component of our national strength? Um, we've used innovation that has been associated with the general purpose force, the airplanes, the bombers, and, and, and other capabilities, targeting, et cetera, how you use intelligence, to come from a level of 30,000 plus nuclear weapons to the current today, you know, the, the uh, New START Treaty called for 1550, and the president has recently come out publicly and said 1,000 is probably enough. That drawdown is a result of innovation, technology, the ability to apply, et cetera. The threat has really remained relatively static. The Russians have what was, was associated with the Soviet Union significantly less, still have a lot of aspirant nations, and that number is likely to grow. So you have the capability out there. The question is, you know, particularly when I look at missile defense, other kinds of capability, we're still in a mutual assured destruction strategy associated with Russia, but we're not in a mutual assured destruction strategy with China. We don't need to be with other countries. It's a choice that we make. Okay, so the question now becomes how much is enough, and then how much of these new technologies would offset, let's say. My sense, purely an opinion, is that for the next few years, um, think 20, we're going to be in an augment kind of format. And then we're going to start to move towards, in, in lieu of, we will do X. Um, we did that in the chemical treaties when we, when we got rid of chemical weapons. We've done that in the landmine treaties as we've gotten rid of those. We make a conscious decision as a nation to say, I'll do something else to give me the capacity and capability I need in that area, what was done before with chemical or et cetera. But I'm not going to play there. I've made a moral decision or whatever. So my sense is you know, that it'll take us about 20 years, I'm just guessing here, to move. The challenge that we have is the recapitalization decisions are being made now. Okay. And that's, that's a major challenge. And the money that will come due will peak in the 20s at the same time that F-35, aircraft carriers, submarines, et cetera, will peak. We can't afford all of this. That, you know, my devious side would say that may be a good thing. It'll make us make choices. And the question then is, are the alternatives reasonably ready to assume some of the role when you combine them with strategy, which is at the essence of this. What is it I'm trying to get my, what kind of influence am I trying to exert on my adversary? And can I come up with a strategy along with the technology to, to be compelling? And that's what we lack today. And there's, there's such a gap between general purpose force and the use of nuclear weapons. And once you cross it, you know, if I don't know who my adversary is, really tough to use a nuclear weapon. If I, you know, so where are, how are we going to start to fill in these ambiguities that we're dealing with in the 21st century that were not necessarily a part of what we used them for in the 20th century? Back there, with the finger up. Good afternoon, Andrew Smith. I'm an independent researcher from Australia. Uh, my, my question relates, so we'll use the, the rich uh, IED experience and MEMRAPs, because that's just one of these gifts that keeps on giving when you start to unpeel it. Um, as an example of, uh, I would argue, a, uh, and a capability which emerged uh, and became a strategic uh, surprise that required an institutional response that actually got right into the industrial base of the country in terms of the types of plants that could generate steel to build the vehicles, etc., etc. Um, 
one of the things which is disappointing about that story is how long it took to take the strategic decision to make that change of direction. Uh, even more disappointing when you consider that the eventual technological answer in the form of the MRAP was a thing that the South Africans had solved more than 20 years earlier in the fight against SWAPO. So it is perhaps one of our biggest limitations, not so much uh, the technological and industrial base of the US, which was demonstrated in that case to still be very robust, but uh, the intellectual capacity of our senior decision makers to say, we have been surprised and we're going to have to do something that we don't really want to do uh, in order to address this problem. And I'd argue if you, if you map the timelines from uh, the index point where it should have been obvious that surprise had emerged to the point where the MRAP started rolling off the assembly line. It's, it's better than four years. It's, it's not a good story. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, and I, I think Rebecca hit the nail on the head with this. When we're strategically surprised, we go through culture shock and denial. We go through the five stages of grieving, <laughs> quite frankly, as a nation before we act. Um, it takes time to to respond to these things, to convince ourselves culturally that this is really an issue and a problem. And so, you know, I, the question here is, can you narrow that down and compress that time so that even if you have to do a cost-imposing strategy on yourself and build a platform to address the issue, that you do it in such a way that you're looking responsible. Um, you know, this is tough. Um, but why is it the time? I mean, is this, is this because of the, there's just too much red tape at the Pentagon? There's no, too no, many, no, or is this, no. this, this is, is just the decision making, the, you know, the, the ability of, of men to, to just make, push the button and make the call? It's the ability to address an issue which you have dismissed long ago. I mean, it's the black swan, it's the, wait a minute, this isn't fair, they shouldn't do this. I mean, it's all of those things, and culturally, it's very difficult to convince yourself, particularly in mass, that you missed something. You, you know, you missed something here. You built a military that basically was gonna fly over or run past that threat. And then you found yourself taking a maneuver military and making it basically a um, garrison force. I mean, at the end of the day, you went, you, you slept in a garrison, you were protected in a garrison, you got up and you went out and patrolled and you were vulnerable both in, in your logistics and in your operations, to that threat. I mean, you know, and so, you know, it's 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 discounting it. And we discounted that mentally, not just the United States, not just the military. We discounted that um, as a threat, and you know, we were surprised, just like we were surprised with using airliners as kamikaze-like entities. Uh, and so, you, it just takes a while to react to that, and that's less about. Um, quite frankly, and he's exactly right, if you look at the timelines, it's less about how long it took to produce an MRAP and more about how long it took to make a decision to produce an MRAP. That took much longer. Final question, perhaps? Yes. Sure, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. I'm an analyst. Um, I didn't hear a lot discussed about autonomous or unmanned vehicles as part of this problem. It seemed you were focused more on platforms and the modularity of those platforms, manned platforms, but kick that one around a bit if sure. you may. Love to. <laughs> Tell that's, us why we should be afraid of yeah, fully autonomous lethal robots, as well, we like to call them. That's the cognitive mobility side of this equation. And when you try to think about innovation, uh, let me say this the right way, but uh, except that I'm a Marine and I won't say it exactly right. When you try to think about innovation, you're looking for the maximum number of intersections and adjacencies associated with what it is you're trying to accomplish, okay? So I could come up with an answer that would take care of one group of IEDs. That's okay, but it's not innovation, okay? So in this idea of cognitive mobility, the question is, what are all the adjacencies and dependencies, what you're calling drones and whatnot, but taking, taking the the cognitive responsibilities of the individual and putting them someplace else in the chain, okay, than, than where they are today. The, the, the attractiveness of this is, and, and the reason that it will persist, whether you're talking air, space, um, sea-based, et cetera, is that, you know, there is this cost of uh, having the individual involved. It doesn't cost that much more on the platform to have a, a cockpit. I mean, there are considerations, but, but that's, not, that's statistically not significant. But 
if over 50% of the life of the vehicle is to keep the pilot's muscle hand-eye coordination skills current, that's taking 50% of the fleet away from you at any given time, okay? Which is the case, more than 50%. I mean, for a naval aviator, night trap, 48 hours max, that's all you got, and then you've got to go back and relearn that skill, okay? So if that's true, then think about operations and maintenance costs if I eliminate that. And think about the implications for scale if you eliminate that. The ability to sense, you pick the sense, is far better you know, from a machine than it is for me to go look with my eyes as a pilot rolling in from 20,000 feet and looking down and saying, oh, that's a wedding or that's a, an ambush. Yeah, I don't know. I got 10 seconds to make that decision and the people are not as big as my thumbnail. Okay. You, you don't know, but I can, with optics, I can do all sorts of things. Okay, so, so there are places where it makes sense and there are places where it doesn't make sense and there are places where it's split. You get, you get leverage in both ways. The question now is, if, if I try to keep one pilot per airplane, that kills me, and it's more than one in, in all cases. Um, that kills me in cost. If that pilot, I started flying in the Vietnam era, we were mixed at that point in all the services between enlisted pilots and officers. Now the money I've gotta to pay to have an officer trained to do this is, is off the page. The money that you have to pay if you look at potentially what the Army's deciding to do with Predator, which is E5, you know, because I grew up doing these controls, you know, since I was two years old running them on, on games, it's really not that hard. And if I introduce, you know, the capabilities like you're seeing with the drones at, from Penn State and from um, DARPA, where I can control 10 or 15 of these things, just for the flying part, it's great. People will argue, oh my God, you know, what have you done? You know, the pilot's not up there. Well, I'm trying to find, and, and I have this argument all the time, so I'll just start it again. Give me something that pilot's going to be able to do that the, a guy in City X in the United States can't do, okay? There's a couple of things. Very high dynamic activities, usually found in expansion of the envelope of an aircraft, in other words, defining what it needs, to, what it could potentially do, et cetera. But, Beyond those, I've yet to find that. There is this thing about, oh my God, you know, what if the comms get cut off? What if, you know, there's an attack, like a cyber attack? We went through this big catharsis back in the late 80s when we had to explain, when I was working on, on building airplanes, to the pilots that you're no longer flying an aircraft that the stick is connected to the aircraft. That's long gone. It's connected to a computer. So, if that computer gets attacked, you can move that stick around all you want. It ain't gonna change anything, okay? So, so the, the issue here really is, what do you want it to be able to do? What could you have it do if, if you displaced the cognitive power of the individual to some other place, but yet made it relevant? Those kinds of thought processes, whether it be air, sea, subsurface, space, I mean, there is so much more you can do to address what you believe are emergent threats and trends by displacing. And that's true in medicine, that's true in logistics, and so you have a huge number of interdependencies and intersections here where this is starting to make an awful lot of sense. The question is, you know, how are we gonna apply it? We're at the end of our time, I wanna say you've got one, in one sentence, your MRAP moment, what would, what would you change? <laughs> what would you decide? What's your big, your big push? I, I personally, as I, as I said before, I, I would really believe we, we need to take a dramatic uh, look at our export licensings and our ability to work technology programs with other countries. Spreading technology. That's the thing. Or, or sometimes we're the recipient. Good. Rebecca? Autonomy. It's time to try this out in field demonstrations. So we have a better sense of what truly autonomous vehicles can and can't do uh, in an operational setting. That terrifies me. You? <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, uh, it's the lethal it, robots part it, that, we, it, that we get. That's just, it's yeah. inevitable. You know, you get. The, the two pieces here that I think are really critical have been brought out, and I thought Rebecca brought it out. Number one is 
what we're going to be surprised about is not an innovation. It's about a strategy or a technique or a, a, a doctrine that surprises us, and then we go into denial and take too long to respond to it. And then on the other side of the equation, where is the right place to put the cognitive power of the man in these warlike scenarios or war, war scenarios relative to the machines, and how do we maintain agility, understanding that we're not going to guess what the next conflict's going to be? Well, there are far too many choices for one panel to discuss, and probably far too many for the Pentagon and Congress to get through this year. But uh, thank you for tackling them and for addressing them for our audience. A uh, uh, round of applause for this panel. Thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>